Hello, so today I'm joined by Rory Underwood. Um, very few introductions, I think, with Rory. Uh, obviously, uh, famous England rugby star and uh, RAFS winner as well. But today we're going to be talking about business predominantly, um, and we're both based in Grantham. So this is the next episode of Great Grantham Business News. Um, so I guess the first question, Rory, um, how have you ended up in Grantham, setting up a business in Grantham? Um, well, Grant, basically Air Force. Just okay. Simple as that. Um, joined the Air Force in 1983. Um, ended up um, coming down to Cromwell to go through officer training and went through flying training. Yeah. And um, that, that got me into the area. But why I stayed here is that once I got around a certain point and ended up at Cuddesmore flying the tornado, that's where I met my future wife, Wendy. And she was in a traffic controller at Cuddesmore. So when we got married, she stayed based at Cuddesmore. Yeah. I was there by then down at um, Whitton flying the cameras down there. Um, and we sort of based ourselves around there. So we first we bought our first house together in Skillington um, back in 87 uh, and then moved into Grantham in 89. I'm, I'm ex Royal Navy, my business model is ex Army, you're ex Royal Air Force. How, how do you find being a going military into running your own business? How, how did that, how do you find that went? Um, well, I'm not the sort of standard military person that suddenly just leaves and moves out because of. Main because of the rugby, as so yeah. for anybody who's in the military but has a very large um, uh, life outside the military. So you know, if you don't live on on the station or camp, mm -hmm. uh, you live off camp, and you have a quite a large extracurricular activity. Obviously, it, it sort of um, what's the best way it balances out um, the way you live your life and the way that the balance of work and um, you know um, civilian stroke yeah. uh, service life because you know. We've all been in the situation, you know, for you guys, you're either stuck on a, uh, a boat out in the middle of um, the Ogden somewhere. Yes. Or you are um, at, a, at a camp or the base down on the south coast. Yeah. For us, we're also on a, on a military base. And the good thing about it is you're in, in amongst your, your brethren, you're in amongst those who've got very good social and, um, you know, support um, facilities and everything's on there that you need. And so if you stay in that and you're there, virtually 100% of the time, you get used to a certain way of life and whatever. So when you come out and you're going into Civic Street, yeah. you know, I completely understand why for times it's it's very hard for some people to get their head around, or oh, I just go and speak, oh, who do I go and speak to now? That support structure yeah. is nowhere near the same as it was when you were in the, in the services. Um, for me, uh, virtually as soon as we got married, we so I, my first four years was um, living in the mess. Um, but as soon as we got married, we lived off station because obviously mm -hmm. we were two different stations. Um, and so we settled into virtually, you're like any other people working in that you stayed you know, out in your home or whatever, and then you drove into work. And so the um, majority of my job was nine to five, but obviously I used to fly nights, I used to fly weekends on detachments, be away on detachments at times with the Air Force. Uh, but it was like anybody else having a job and going away on business mm -hmm. trips or whatever. So consequently, by the time I got to my 38 point when I left the military, I'd spent, you know, I, I was literally, I was a military person, but I was, you know, yeah. getting into work. Okay. I would say nowadays, the military probably, there's a lot more percentage of the military, I think, probably do live off than live on. Um, so it may be different, but, but when I was going through, when we were going through, um, that was the way. So when I left, literally, the day, uh, you know, my last day was... In, in a flying suit my last trip mm -hmm. and then the following day was literally um, I had to restart the business and I was, I was stepping into my own business I created with two other guys um, I was literally in t-shirt shorts into my study at home um, trying to run a business yeah now there were other challenges don't get me wrong you know but with, the, with the point of the question being what's it like going from um, military into civilian I completely understand there are some challenges yes. you, you, your, your mindset the people you work with how things happen um, are all different to the way it happens in civilian streets and half the times I think for a lot of both people that are and you've heard me speak many times over yes. the years <clears throat> the whole context one of the things I always talk to um, uh, ex or you know leaving uh, services uh, service leavers is trying to get your head around that you are highly skilled you are a highly motivated person because you've been in the military, otherwise you would have got in there. Yeah. And how to how to understand that and capitalise on that when you come into Civil Street, as well as saying to a lot of um, uh, civilian 
um, companies that if um, you are potential of hiring and taking on ex-military people, if you get your understanding of them right and you press the right buttons, you get a very well high high trained yeah, absolutely, yeah. individual. So I'm a big advocate of that. But yeah, I was just, one of the things I quite often share with people who have got that concern about how they can transition or having problems is those a series of I think there's two or three veteran works videos. I think you in what you're a um, and one of them I think right. done with the Light Officer Association, which just really shows so well with well known people, mm. you know, how veterans work. So, don't get me wrong, there are, you know, I, I completely get, you know, if, 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 if a military person goes in with a military mindset into the yeah. organization, they will ruffle feathers, feathers yeah. you know. Um, and so it's, it's that, it's both sides recognizing how to get the best out of each other. Yeah. Um, and that's half the challenge. That's, that's, that's the bit. But, you know, I hear so many people who come out of the military, so sort of, Underconfident and having a silly street. Oh, I, how do I? How do I? You know, I don't understand my trans, transferable kids yeah. skills, and that's what stuff. That's where it help people like yourselves. You know, that's yeah. where you try and help them understand that. Yeah, we we meet them all the time. We, everything from companies, organisations say, I want to recruit veterans, like military. You know, they ask why, and then to people who are really struggling as well. So that's that's obviously what we deal in day in day out. Mm. So is it Wingman is your current company? Um, yes. I'm right to say you're 15 years old this year. I am in April. I mean, it's just, you know, <laughs> where's that time gone? It really is frightening. <laughs> Uh, 15 years, yeah, 2009. Literally, it was a, a phoenix out of the um, uh, the crash in 2008 uh, with the previous company. Yeah, and we we had we didn't go bust, but it was struggling. I decided it was probably time to leave. I've been without the company 10 years. Um, I, I I fancied doing my own, being my own because three of us were in charge before when I wasn't yeah. my own boss. So I decided now was an opportune time to to jump ship. So I did uh, managed to get myself out of it. As, as divorcing from a, a partnership, you know, uh, limited company, yeah. it went very, very painlessly. Um, and yeah, so first of April, there was no no reason for it being first of April. I don't know if the timing fitted, but obviously it's the birth of the Air Force as well. But there was nothing. There's no reason for doing <laughs> that. But that's that's yeah. So uh, first of April in in what two? I don't think it was half of January. Or January. <laughs> I know it's actually crazy. <laughs> so for, for people who are not aware of Wingman, can you summarise what Wingman is all about? Yeah, I mean, when I left the military, um, ex, you know, obviously rugby player, ex um, fast jet pilot, you sort of think you've got something about you that businesses would like to hear about: high performance individuals, high performance yeah. teams, and also high performance organisations. Um, and what started out with my skill set, I was a, I was a trained instructor in, in the uh, the military. I've spoken at many, many uh, events. People used to hire me for keynote speaking. But one of the challenges was trying to get my head around, you know, at, at the peak, you get it paid a lot of money for standing on stage for half an hour, 45 minutes to do a keynote speech. Yeah. But you, you, you arrive, say hello, you say speech, once people say it's great, it doesn't connect with everybody. I'm not, I'm not naive to, to recognize that, you know. Um, and uh, then you go. And I didn't quite find this fulfilling as, as you know, working with the clients and developing relationships mm -hmm. and trying to really get the full understanding of high performance teams etc which is my real passion um, into organizations so along the way it started when i left the military into more sort of learning development high performance teams type scenarios working with the senior um, business leaders mm -hmm. and senior teams and that that, that was quite well as i said 10 years with the previous company yeah uh, and then when the crash happened, it was obviously one of that type of scenarios, a bit like what we've had in the last, uh, you know, four four years or so. And um, uh, when I set off my own company, there were several things that came into mind. One is, I recognised that a lot of it was the personality. The three of us were quite personality driven, um, strong characters, strong stories, strong background stories, mm. etc. And that's one of the reasons why businesses like this, which is a good thing in one way. But another way is, how do you scale up or how do you grow? And then obviously at the later, st later stages, how do you then potentially uh, capitalize on your uh, your growth and, and sell on or whatever? Yeah. And so therefore, one of the challenges was that I knew that I couldn't rely on me completely. Yes, my name, getting into the door, that sort of yeah. stuff. But it can't be on me because I can't do everything. I can only work, work so many days of the year, so you're limiting how much money you can earn. So unless yeah. you create some sort of IP, some sort of repeat um, uh, revenue stream, etc. You're going to be struggling, and of course, just being fundamentally, you could argue, a glorified uh, learning development <laughs> stroke high performance team sort of consultant. Yeah. Um, and that's not to, to downgrade that, but you know, it is. But how do you how do you make the most of that? How do you scale that up? Because how do you find another, you know, ex international sports person, ex military fast jet, and it's yeah. got, you know, fifty at the time. 
you know, 15, 10, 15 years worth of experience in, in consultancy. Uh, not, they don't fall off the tree a lot of the place. So trying to find somebody to help you in that side was, was a real challenge. Okay. And so what started out about trying to create an idea of, of some sort of a proposition um, that really had an IP attached to it, which therefore made the, the company much more appear, uh, appealing. And so what has happened over those 15 years in that mindset of trying to achieve something was that I've sort of moved from that working with senior teams or whatever into an area that is tying with that in the sense of we now deal with companies and we're, we're strategic um, strategy consultants. So I help businesses understand how to, um, to enable businesses how to deliver their strategy effectively. With the main premise being that, you know, a lot of companies don't have strategies. That's mm -hmm. one thing. So I try and help them get their strategies. Yeah. Uh, those <laughs> that do have strategies, they've got a strategy and it's written on the board, but they don't really know what it means. Yeah. And if, if the senior team don't know what it means, I guarantee you, nobody the rest of the business know what it means. We just do what we've always done and hopefully make money. And do you do work in it, you sort of... Well, any particular type of company, particular size or stage of, of the no, company? No, it's not. I'm not in a, in a particular uh, sector. What I tend to find is that um, I don't work with the public public sector. The main reason it's just too much of a pain to try and get business out of them. So I just I just don't go yeah. there. Uh, you know, I'd love to because you know they are there our public servants, but uh, it's just too difficult. Tender yeah. process and all different things of jumping through hoops. I just don't have the uh, time and effort and resources to do all that sort of stuff. So I don't, I don't get involved with them. Certain partnerships as well are much harder because of the way that the format the, the business, especially large um, partnership type businesses. So apart from that, it, I really, you know, I've been into all different. One of the things I love about my job is that every time I get a new client, I'm into a different sector, looking at different things in the way that something happens. And you learn so much about what goes on that area. That's one of the things I enjoy about my job. The people side of things, <laughs> most of it's the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, as you get to know the people, you meet new people, you make new relationships, but then you find out about a lot of business, whether it's in defense, whether it's in uh, utilities, whether it's in holiday companies, whether it's in insurance, whatever. There's always something you learn about against business and you don't realize and it just broadens your mind. We were talking earlier about um, the, the last couple of years, what it's been like running a particular sm a small, medium sized business, yeah. you know, the financial crash, Brexit. The pandemic, another financial crash now with multiple world wars at the moment. Yeah. Um, but also a lot of that's brought in change around home working, hybrid working, four days a week. And yeah. we had to change your your mythologies at all over the last couple of years to, to, to reflect that with your clients. Um, no, to be honest with you. Okay. Because um, it's been a real challenge. I remember when we went into lockdown and we thought, that's it, the, at the end of the office. Yeah. I didn't believe that. I'm, if you think about my whole, my, my passion and what I'm dealing with, around high performance teams and organizations we are a tribal creatures we like company there are people that don't but we yeah. some we like being with other people we do get our best when we work with other people so um from that point um you know getting the best out of people for me i'm a big believer that face to face is is the best way but there are needs that you don't have to and there are some people that don't want to and you can get by it in certain ways you know who never heard of zoom four years ago i know nobody I know the Skype and it was useless, <laughs> yeah. but I, I never, I never heard of Zoom and Teams. I didn't realize it was a more of a you know video as a Teams or collaboration tool. I yeah. don't know. Um, and having gone from hardly ever using it because it didn't really work very well, to suddenly uh, six months later, it was one of the you know main methodologies by which you communicate now, and it's taken as the norm now to use Teams or Zoom calls on a regular basis. But in the way that I facilitate and run my sessions with the senior teams, etc. Um, and having been through that period when I tried to run sessions with 15, 20 people, it's hard work. And it's, it's not the same as facilitating in a room when you can see everybody. And even worse, when you try and get some people to say, oh, we've got, you know, of, of the 10 people, we've got eight in, but there's two want to do and, 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 and log in. So you've got two people. On the thing. <laughs> yeah. It is just a nightmare. It really is. So that's one of the challenges. So uh, if you take uh, working from home as a separate uh, discussion, but the whole context of how it's affected me, <clears throat> every client I've spoken to, they all recognize that when we do anything, this it, it will be face to face. So that, yeah. that makes life so much easier. Um, but then the challenge of working from home is a real challenge. You know, everybody thought that's it, the officers, you know, Canary Wolf become a ghost town, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, the, the pendulum swung so one way, people thought, oh, we can save some money by, you know, reducing our um, 
overheads from yes. you know, business costs yes. or whatever. Um, but then the realization that obviously some people, you know, the assumption is that everybody can work from home, and the reality is not everybody can work from home. You know, in the early stages, we had pe- you know two people, obviously, you know, either a couple or partners or husband and wife or, or whatever, mm. were working at the same desk trying to have two teams calls across the desk because you really have spare to be able to work in. Oh, we've, got, we've got some clients who have started working from home in early retirement, great to work at home, but now it's like, I want to get back to work. Yeah, yeah I'm not fed up with that. I don't want to retire anymore. So yeah, we, get a, we have, a, have that more, more often now, but certainly a lot of companies going back to there some, uh, there, there, working. Yeah, I get that. Some people, it, it works for them. I get that. Yeah. Um, but there are some people, they want to go to work. They want to go and see people. They want yeah. to be in, in their environment rather than stuck at home on their own. Um, you know, for lockdown, for us living here out in the countryside, it's brilliant, you know. It's fantastic. Two minutes walk out the door and then whatever. <laughs> but some of the people were, I mean, a lot of my friends who've got their kids working in London or whatever in flats and stuff, it was horrendous. Yeah, I did yeah. that commute to London for many years. But uh, yeah. t- t- today um, they call it Blue Monday. So there's loads of stats out today about wellness at work and thought and stats. It's today Blue Monday. Today's Blue Monday. Two, two, weeks, you, up, so two weeks after the... Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, I heard on the news this morning, there's loads of stats out around about two thirds of workers aren't happy at work or three quarters aren't happy and all this well-being thing. So yeah, every year we have this uh, Blue Monday. Um, what are your thoughts for well-being work about, about, about a happy workforce? And you know, I think I don't know, the stats are quite high saying it's just, know, anything from two thirds to three quarters are, are not happy at work. Do you see that in your... Um, <clears throat> it, it's always a difficult one because you know one's perception of whether they're happy or not is, yeah. is their own. You can never tell them it's right or wrong. I've never seen any change over the last couple of years. I mean, it's, uh, it, well, it's very difficult as yeah. well. The numbers are the last three, four years are going to be very difficult yeah. because of the variety yeah. of things. There's more people working at home and people like working at, at, work, at work than they're going to be unhappy. There's going to be a lot of people haven't been told to come into work and they want to work at home. And, you know, one one thing someone said to me the day, oh, I'll just talk about travel or whatever, and they said, oh, I'll be quiet today, it's Monday. And, yeah, it's just, because most people that can work from home, if they can, they'll decide Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, work home Monday and, and Friday. <laughs> yeah. And they've got to like a sort of a, you know, take it the right way, but you know, extend sort of working week, uh, sort of a weekend because the Monday and Fridays. Um, my, my daughter works for a company where they can't, they, they're th- three days in the office, two days off, but they can't work the same days in the office got you. and days at work. Okay. Um, have to spread it, spread it around and, and chop and change. Uh, which makes sense of that. And that for me is 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 the way it's really still happening at the moment. Part of the challenge you've got is managers and leaders in businesses having to think a little bit more laterally around all their people and the way they work now than they did before. Yeah. Now, one of the things is, you know, there'll be some people here, whatever listen they talk is work from home stuff, will go, I don't know what the problem is, I can't work from home. You know, how much of our industry, how much of our you know, what work goes in this business can actually work from home. Yeah. It's not, you know, 80%, 90%. How much of ours is manufacturing? Exactly this part of the world, yeah. You can't. Yeah, you know, it's not many people in Market gardening yeah. or yeah. logistics. Yeah. You can't do that from, uh, no. you know, home at uh, whatever. So there's a there's a vast wave of, of any country that's got a lot of people who are doing manual, if not um, procedural, whatever work that requires you know, um, them to be in an office or building or whatever. So you, geographically, do you do, do you do make your clients are pretty spread across the UK or do you have a little... I don't know, yeah, I'll take a client yeah. wherever they come from, I'll, okay. I'll travel. I've, I've done the whole of this country yeah. in the four corners. Uh, you know, I've been up to Aberdeen, Barrow and Furness, Dover, somewhere, so I've been down to Plymouth as well, so there you go, four corners of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair bit. So and as far as the business outlook at the moment, you know, if you had any advice to people considering setting up their own business at the moment, what, what, would you, what are your thoughts on that? It's a bit, bit, of, a, bit of a tough question maybe to throw at you. But. Well, it's always a difficult one. In, in some ways, it's a real frustration because I thought I set my business straight after the, um, the crash. Yeah. And you sort of think, if you're going um, to set a company up, just doing it after a crash, after a dip, is one of the best times to do it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and we had a good run for about, uh, how long was it till, uh, 20, about 12, 12, 13 years before we then had the uh, pandemic. Um, so if you can get through this, for us who have been around for a while, we get through this next you know, period and we, we come out of the side, then you have another you know, um, boost as, as company starts settling down and then you know, try and make money again and grow. Um, so there's a lot to be said for, for starting a business now. Yeah. Like anything else, 
you know, one of the things that for us have been around for, if, you, if something scratched, never had to run a business before, it's a real major challenge. Yes, I've been through that. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've run two companies. Yeah. Um, the first one with some colleagues and this one on my own. So I'm still learning all the time about running businesses. The last three years I've been learning a load more stuff about myself um, yeah. and my companies. And we've been talking before about, you know, some of the challenges with clients and how big your client should be, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And how that can, and, you know, you're learning all It is. I mean, I went from being an officer of the Royal Navy to working in big blue corporates in, in, in the city. Yeah. To running a you know to setting up a, a business and then you know even how you work with people how you manage people how do you lead it's, it's very different to what the forces to in the corporate world to in a, into a micro business it's so different I just find a micro business everyone's lives and breathes your journey as well you, yeah. you know it's not them it's your oh you're yeah there's hundred you know, percent so. that um, and all of, I would say that underlying there are there are tenants that hold true wherever you are. Mm. But then there are the variations and the variations and nuances of how you do certain things from the military to the yeah. to the big blue chip companies to the medium sized companies to the small companies. You know, I'm I'm a small business based out of Long Bennington, so you know I've got less than ten, less than ten people working for me, um, and you know, a lot of the procedural and various bits you don't have to worry about because you're there all the time talking to each other. Yeah. Then you start getting to 40, 50, 60, 100 people. Then you've got to think of a different way about how you manage that company because you can't deal with all the people all the time and you've got to rely on your your next level down your managers etc to talk again so you rely on them and you 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 know you delegate them to go and run some parts of the business for you then how do you maintain consistency yeah and then you that you know and, and the whole reason why i got into strategic consultancy is because it's all trying to do that but get, what's the common thread well having a strategy is that common thread that everyone understands what are we trying to do who are doing it with? How do we make sure we're all doing it the same way? And of course, that was missing. Yeah, my business is going through a change at the moment. So having sort of read about uh, what Wingman does and what you do as well, it's kind of, it's got me thinking, does, does everybody in my organisation share the same strategic view I currently have? Because that's changed yeah. as it was last year. It's difficult, it was three years ago. And, and we're a small company, but we have a baby boomer. We have Gen Z. We have a couple of millennials. No, sort of Gen X. That's Gen Z. My colleague Devon over there. So you have a baby boomer, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z, and, yeah. and that creates its own dynamics it and interests as well. You know, and I mean, one of the things as well that I I went through one of the early stages of, of going to consultancy. Well, a lot of the stuff about culture was going on before when it was culture, yeah, cultural clash, cultural change, all sorts of stuff. And one of the things I remember going off to do a, a two day workshop for a big European company. I went into Poland. Okay. So I went to Poland. There were some issues between the French company and the Danish uh, supplier. And they said they've got big, massive cultural problems. Went in there. So I went in there, ran a whole facility session for two days with all the senior managers from the holidays. I was 20, 30 of them or whatever. And I just broke them to talk about some of the issues and whatever. And what really came out to me at the end of it was culture was just the, the end symptom of what it was coming out. It was just people looked at things in a different way. And that's no different to anything else about the way we do. You know, we have people who like, if you give them a job, I'll do it straight away. Oh, well, yeah. I'd have to do it for three weeks. I'll do it in two and a half weeks' time. So we're all slightly different, and the whole context of how we better understand each other, so that we can, uh, not so much compromise, but how can we work with each other to get the most effective and efficient result at the end of it? So that you know, if you like doing the job straight away, and I'm sort of like, I'll wait till I have to do it, you know, two weeks, and we have to work together as a team. That applies across the whole situation. So in the context of strategy, the way you're working, whether you're a millennial, uh, Gen Z, guess what? Talk to each other and find out, understand from your perspective. What, what does it mean? Why is it important to you? Yeah. What do you think that means for you? How do you think that applies to you? Do you understand if you do it that way with me, this is what happens, but then I need to understand why that impacts on you and why that's changed the way you... So a lot of that, you know, I say it so many times, slightly tongue-in-cheek, but it is so true. You know, if a lot more people talk to each other openly, transparently, and honestly about all these sort of things, I'd be out of a job as a consultant. But of course people don't because they're all busy and they don't talk to each other as much as they should do by understanding it. So that goes down the strategy. If you asked every single person in a business, and I'm saying about yours, but any yeah. business, what do you think the strategy is? Yeah. And they ask it like 100 percent different, different ways. No, it got me thinking. I was sort of reading about what you do this morning. If I ask the question of the room, you're absolutely right. There'd be the different answers as well. I want talking is important as well. Um, I was mentioning we've been a new chap join us as a business development. Yeah. Um, comes from a much larger organisation. Something I'm familiar with, having worked in sales before, was the sales scrum. So he said, "Do you do a sales scrum?" I said, 
no, <laughs> we don't. I know, I know what I've done. I've, I've done yeah. those before. So we've introduced those now. Where it's where it's literally there's no desk. We just stood around, yeah. having a chat, and it's and it's getting people to talk openly. And because yeah. um, we've not done that for quite a while, then trying to get people to talk openly, it started to come around there. But it, yeah, it's, it's so important. It's it's giving benefits. It's the way already. of trying to align. So the, so you know, the, the biggest challenge you have. So it, two very simple dynamics and axes, we call it. Mm. Yeah. One is the vertical thing is from the strategy. A, it's a strategic language. So how does the person at the bottom understand what the hell that means anyway? Yeah. So how do you make sure that that strategy is, is percolated down uh, through the organisation so everyone understands what direction we're going to, how we're with each other, and how to make sure we're doing it the right way and you know, uh, stay aligned? And then if that isn't right, well, how do you expect everybody in the organisation to be working cross-functionally as effectively mm. as they can? So it's both the, the vertical line and the horizontal. Yeah. And I guarantee every organisation I've been to cross-functionally across the business is never, I'm not going to say poor, I'm just going to say never anywhere near as effective as it can be. Yeah. And so, but part of that is because if the, if the vertical things aren't done right, so the lack of strategy, then people go, well, what's important for me? Well, I just got to deliver what my boss says, so I'll just deliver that. And so straight away, you have these competing priorities. So I'll deliver what I need to do. The fact that it affects everybody else, the most important thing is the top one, but they don't, they just think about, my time as long as I do that and I won't get shouted at and I'll get my bonus or whatever <laughs> so straight away you create competing priorities yeah so you've got to overcome that because you've got competing priorities you end up having this ineffective cross-functional ways of working and it's incredible that I, I see this day and day out when I go and meet clients or potential clients where you speak to HR you speak to the hiring manager you might speak to the directors yeah. The different views that people have, oh, yeah. just what they're looking to recruit for, it can be, can be like, extremely I'll give, I'll give difficult. This, this is the best way of describing it, yeah. What I see when you go in is you have a, 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 a boss, MD, CEO, whatever, chat, whatever yeah. it is, and they will articulate a vision. And most people ask, right? Yeah, I, I get that, okay. But what happens is when you articulate that to your senior team, what do they do? Each of them goes up and goes, well, I need to do this rich sales, I need to do this yeah. operation, I need engineering, HR, finance, IT. So each of them goes, I'll just do this bit, because that's my responsibility. Yeah. So theoretically, you've already created a solid organization. Because all they're going to do is go off and do their own bit. So they go to the top of their own mm. department and say, right, this is what we're going to do. And each of it, their um, you know, minions go off and go, well, I'll do this bit, I'll do this bit, I'll do this bit. Yeah. Straight away, you have this cascade of siloed thinking going down to an organization. Yeah. Crazy. So last question for you. I know, I know you, you talk about setting goals. You got any, any plans for this year or the next year or two of you put for England um, and yourself? This year is reasonably exciting. I mean, you know, it's like anything else, the ups and downs of us small businesses. Yeah. Know, cash flow is big <laughs> and it's so true. But, you know, yeah, cash absolutely. flow, it, you know, over the years, it, it, it's no different whether you're a less than a million pound turnover or you're a billion pound turnover business. Cash flow is the biggest killer. Yeah. It's just different types of numbers. Um, and it's, you know, when I first started doing it, it was a certain number, it's sort of like, you know, what do I need a month? And then, it doesn't take much for you to get to a certain size. You go, how much do we need a month? <laughs> you know, to pay for people and play for us. That's, that's, that's the thing. You know, the biggest yeah. thing that keeps me up at night is is that. Yeah, me too. And so, um, from 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 that perspective, my goal is like yours. You know, you're constantly trying to increase your um, numbers of uh, clients and keep that. You're trying to get to that position where you feel as if the bread and butter is there. I have to worry about the bread and butter. I'm trying to get the nice cream on top. Of <laughs> yeah, which is always the, the aspiration. But one of the exciting things uh, from our perspective is we're in, in the strategy stuff that we're doing and everyone we're trying to put together, we're, we're in um, a JV with a company looking at doing um, a bit of software that helps us to A, provide a dashboard, but also create in the terms a digital twin of the business from a okay. people, people systems and process perspective, yeah. some of the, 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 the triumvirate. Um, and so that's quite exciting this year that hopefully by the, you know, middle of this year we've got this that we can start um, uh, including it in part of our, um, our our offering but it then also creates a potential uh, revenue stream because one of the advantages I've always had in my mind from early stages how can I earn money while I'm asleep because if it's always me having to earn the money yeah then it gives limitations if if it's stuff that you can do while you're asleep and that takes a different proposition on of course then you create a revenue stream you create some sort of IP around it and then suddenly the value of the business essentially becomes much more um, uh, and the positive side and so um, the goal for me for this year is to try and get that up and running and, and start you know unleashing that and that'll be that'll be if we do that it'll be great it's a big step change for us so fingers crossed good well thank you very much for coming Roy good to speak to you